Iran and Pakistan seem to be escalating their conflict recently. Iran launched missile attacks on Pakistan, claiming to be targeting terrorists and terrorist organizations. However, it was a direct airstrike using single warhead missiles. Pakistan retaliated swiftly, carrying out airstrikes on seven locations in southeastern Iran near the Pakistani border, involving fighter jets, missiles, and drones. Pakistan's response was aggressive and severe. Pakistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued a statement titled Markbar Sarmikar. The statement asserted that Pakistan conducted a series of precisely targeted military strikes against terrorist hideouts in Iran's Balochistan province. The operation, codenamed Markbar Sarmikar, resulted in the killing of several terrorists who had taken refuge in ungoverned areas of Iran. Pakistan had previously expressed concerns about these Pakistani terrorists, known as Sarmikars, and shared evidence of their presence and activities. However, the lack of action on this issue led to continued attacks and bloodshed against innocent Pakistanis. The military action was based on reliable intelligence indicating that the Sarmikars were planning large-scale terrorist activities. The operation showcased Pakistan's determination to protect its national security. The statement emphasized Pakistan's respect for Iran's sovereignty and territorial integrity, claiming that the actions were solely aimed at safeguarding. Pakistan's own security and national interests, Pakistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs defended its actions, emphasizing its commitment to upholding the principles and the purposes of the Uncharter, including the territorial integrity and sovereignty of member states. The statement declared that Pakistan will never allow its sovereignty and territorial integrity to be challenged under any pretext while acknowledging Iran as a brotherly country and expressing respect for the Iranian people. The statement stressed the need for dialogue and cooperation to address common challenges such as terrorism, despite Pakistan's attempt to frame its actions as counterterrorism efforts. They were a clear violation of Iranian sovereignty. The use of fighter jets to penetrate Iranian airspace marked the first such incursion since the 1980s Iran-Iraq war. This response from Pakistan is likely to escalate the conflict. Further, in response to Pakistan's actions, Iran began military exercises near the Pakistani border. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps announced its readiness for ground military operations. Meanwhile, the Pakistani foreign minister condemned Iran's attack as a violation of international law and a breach of bilateral relations. He emphasized Pakistan's right to respond to this provocative act and stressed the need for coordinated efforts to combat terrorism. In the region, Pakistan's strong response can be seen as an attempt to unlock a key to a new phase. In the conflict, by taking decisive military action, Pakistan has opened a door that may lead to further escalation. Take a look, everyone, the foreign ministry is just that, the foreign ministry. Pakistan's foreign ministry knows how to package a military operation as both counterterrorism and a display of professional coordination and targeted precision military strikes. The implication is that if this strike is an absolute violation of another country's sovereignty, then Pakistan could reciprocate by violating Iran's sovereignty, Iran says. I'm hitting Pakistan, but it's not a violation of sovereignty, it's eliminating terrorists. Pakistan responds, I'm hitting you to eliminating terrorists. Iran, if you say it's not a violation of my sovereignty, then Pakistan hitting you isn't a violation either. We are all brothers, right? 
Pakistan acknowledges this, saying, where both brotherly nations and the people of Pakistan have great respect and affection for the people of Iran, then the suggestion is that if Pakistan hits Iran, it's for free if Iran responds, it escalates, Pakistan is helping eliminate terrorists for free, wasting missiles, any objections, Iran is that the logic. So, Pakistan's foreign ministry statement is bound to escalate the situation further. To put it plainly, Iran launches two missiles at Pakistan, Pakistan's immediate response. Fighter jets entering another country's airspace about 40 to 50 kilometers deep. Online discussions mention that this is the first time since the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s that fighter jets have entered Iran for a strike, a direct military action. Furthermore, Pakistan issues a statement to Iran, don't be nervous, this isn't a violation of sovereignty we respect. Iran's sovereignty and territorial integrity, we are just targeting terrorists, seeing this essentially treats each other party as naive. Pakistan's response directly leads to an imminent escalation. Iran has already started military exercises near Pakistan, citing Al Jazeera. Reports that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard has begun military exercises in the southeast region near the Pakistan border, ready for ground military action, although it's January 17. Pakistan's foreign minister leading a delegation at the non-aligned movement ministerial meeting in Uganda receives a call from Iran's foreign minister. The foreign minister strongly emphasizes that Iran's attack on Pakistan on January 16 not only seriously violated Pakistan's sovereignty, but also grossly violated international law and the spirit of bilateral relations between Pakistan and Iran, Pakistan unequivocally condemns this attack, stating that it severely damages the relationship between the two countries. The foreign minister adds that Pakistan reserves the right to respond to this provocative act. Pakistan's foreign ministry emphasizes that terrorism is a common threat in the region, requiring coordinated efforts to combat it. Unilateral actions could seriously jeopardize regional peace and stability, and no country in the region should tread this dangerous path. This was also published on the Pakistan Foreign Ministry website. This is the information released by Pakistan's foreign ministry. It states that Iran, without cause, blatantly violated Pakistan's sovereignty, violating international law and the principles of the United Nations Charter. Such unlawful behavior is entirely unacceptable and unreasonable. This message has been conveyed to the Iranian government, and Iran will entirely Bear the consequences, Pakistan reserves the right to react to this illegal action, and the responsibility for the consequences will be entirely on Iran. Look, Iran struck first, using various excuses, much like Hamas launching attacks on Israel. Even if they claim it's for the independence of Palestine, which is not allowed under International law, even if you claim it's in the name of counterterrorism, it doesn't hold. Pakistan is now responding forcefully because it has found a crucial key to open this military action door. Pakistan is a complex entity. We often say it has both military and political dimensions. Before 2010, Pakistan was predominantly a military powerhouse. With its intelligence system strongly linked to the government, presently, the government in Pakistan is relatively weak, while its military is intricate, maintaining TIs with both China and the United States. However, Pakistan has not aligned itself with Russia, especially during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Back then, Pakistan allied with the United States, 
supporting Afghan guerrilla fighters with weapons or intelligence personnel in Pakistan received training in the United States. In fact, in American movies, it's mentioned that individuals from within Pakistan are present in every U.S. meeting, infiltrating Afghanistan and engaging in guerrilla warfare against the Soviets. Even the U.S. base during the Afghan war was in Pakistan. Despite perceptions of a strong China-Pakistan alliance, it is essential to understand that this pack china Friendship is rooted in the historical alliance formed with the United States against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Pakistan's evolution is marked by significant events, such as gaining independence through the Indo-Pak wars and later industrializing due to the Afghan conflict. The latter, in particular, brought substantial benefits to Pakistan as the U.S. highly valued its role after the Soviet withdrawal. However, Pakistan did not become the center of U.S. influence in the region. The turning point came in 2021 when the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan and the Taliban swiftly took control internally. Many who held power in Afghanistan before sought refuge in Pakistan. Some went to Qatar, like Ghani, but others stayed in Pakistan, preparing for a countermove to regain influence in Afghanistan. These individuals also aimed to seek U.S. support, and the U.S. had a condition Pakistan must become a base for attacking Iran. This strategic shift is crucial to understanding the current dynamics. Many talk about the push to regain control in Afghanistan because Pakistan had significant interests in the country during the 20-year U.S.-led Afghan war as the Taliban took over. These interests, primarily financial and assets, were at risk of being seized. China's immediate recognition of the Taliban regime would severely damage the interests of those who were previously aligned with Afghanistan. This situation created internal pressures, leading to a potential shift in power within Pakistan. Additionally, the U.S. wants Pakistan to counter Iran, aligning with historical instances where Pakistan's military actions were connected to U.S. objectives. In summary, Pakistan is intricately tied to regional dynamics and global politics. Its interests span across various regions, creating complexities in its alliances and relationships. The evolving situation in Afghanistan has added further layers to this complexity. With internal power struggles and external pressures shaping Pakistan's response to the changing geopolitical landscape, so Iran's missile strikes against Pakistan that Khomeini made this decision, probably with internal penetration, just like the Syrian defense minister who was taken care of by Israel, is all the same, infiltrated by. Israeli intelligence, there's definitely infiltration here. Iran is definitely regretting it now. I tell you, Khomeini must be regretting these two missile strikes, but they are already done. Let's delve into these details. When we look at these matters, I want to emphasize that the information I'm sharing is exclusive to Lud Media. It's not as simple as just the relations between nations. Similar to the situation with Taiwan, take Pakistan, for example, to understand it, you need to delve into various intelligence operations. In essence, there are intricate workings within. Firstly, what does it mean by operations? For instance, which side is the military in Pakistan a land with? It's akin to the dynamic where China and Pakistan are close. Allies, referred to as Betty, and Iran has a brotherly relationship with Pakistan, much like Taiwan. Let's talk about Taiwan and things become clearer. Within Taiwan, the Kuomintang KMT is pro-China, the legislative Yuan has pro-China members, and the current government, the Democratic Progressive Party DPP, 
led by Lai Chinti is decidedly pro-American, then there's the new party, which is covertly pro-China. It's a complex landscape. To put it simply, each province, like in Pakistan, is equivalent to Taiwan. Taipei is unquestionably KMT territory. While Tainan is DPP territory, Pakistan follows a similar pattern in each province. Some may be pro-American, others pro-Chinese, some might have good relations with Iran and others with India. The key is that different provinces have different sources of power because to become a political figure in a region, you must have backing. Without support, it's impossible to rise. And even if you do, you're susceptible to assassination. It's that straightforward. This is Pakistan's first layer. Now why does Iran mention that even in Balochistan province, there are terrorists opposing Iran. Opposing Iran means opposing China. Therefore, they are not. Aligned with the Chinese Communist Party CCP, understand this logic is the interplay of forces and counter forces, what we often refer to as geopolitical dynamics. This presence is not only about major power competition, consider the first major power competition, the Cold War. Between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, I've discussed Pakistan's relationship with the U.S. over the past few decades, but you could be certain that during the Cold War, the Soviet Union infiltrated Pakistan. It was a tug of war, much like in the TV series The Americans Were Pakistani. Individuals were trained by the CIA and then infiltrated by Soviet KGB agents to disrupt and learn about their channels, particularly the routes for transporting goods into Afghanistan. This pattern of mutual influence is clear. China has operated in Pakistan for many years. Aligning itself with the U.S. at times, essentially using U.S. support to strengthen its own influence. In Pakistan, think about it in Balochistan province with the presence of terrorist organizations resisting something. Does China not provide military support and funding to them? Everything becomes clear when you put it all together. It's a case of mutual influence. You have me. I have you consider Pakistan opposing Iran. Does this have nothing to do with the CCP? Think about international relations and you'll realize that this is the establishment of the world's largest international anti-communist coalition, Pakistan, in alliance with this global anti-communist coalition is a crucial hub in terms of this great conflict, Pakistani military. Leaders, for instance, show no hesitation. They stand firmly with the global anti-communist coalition. The situation is immensely complex. Let's elaborate on this. It's a different mindset. Altogether, a mindset centered around what we call task thinking. Essentially, all these actions amount to a set of tasks. Tasks that even the President of the United States may not be aware of. It's a multitude of concurrent tasks operating on multiple threats. Everything within the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, is under the control of Xi Jinping's decision making. Can he handle it all? To put it plainly, what you see today, such as the situation with Iran that I discussed earlier, is not a random, spontaneous event, it's a meticulously planned, long-term task, shrouded in extreme secrecy, even the U.S. president may be unaware of it, it's a complex assembly of various aspects from the free world converging towards a singular direction. Essentially, the destruction of the CCP, the media won't show you this, I'm telling you. As I mentioned before, orchestrating a missile attack by Iran is just one subtask within this broader mission. How do you then enable Pakistan to counteract? Next, Iran may even attempt ground invasion, a series of interconnected tasks. Let me tell you 
when it comes to these tasks, the trend is unstoppable, I assure you, within this context, the CCP has minimal influence. The trajectory of its tasks is clear. We talked about the Serbia Wu. The project is part of a larger mission where countless endeavors are underway against various aspects of China, Russia, and Iran globally. The Taiwan presidential election is equivalent to a task. Once this task concludes, and if the CCP loses, it's that simple, the next phase of tasks will progress. Chinese people like this conceptualization, simply put, it's geopolitics, national relations, and security is like managing projects akin to building a hotel or developing a software program. However, in China, she personally commands and deploys everything, in contrast, the U.S. system. It's straightforward. The White House doesn't need to know the details. It's just a project. Much like developing an Apple iPhone, countless projects, and one among them is crucial. That's the key. I'm telling you, if you shift your thinking to this mindset, you'll understand why the CCP is bound to lose. It can handle this multi-threaded project. Because there are numerous projects progressing simultaneously, each operating independently. Moreover, the CCP can infiltrate and compromise each line of intelligence. Each line is exceptionally secretive and confidential, unknown to each other. It doesn't need to report to the U.S. president in the U.S., even with presidential changes. It won't impact the project. The project is a commercial entity, much like developing a new iPhone. It goes on regardless of who is in the White House. This is the same logic. The project is to eliminate the CCP. That's what it boils down to. So many projects, from initiation to deployment, with personnel in place and funding secured, every project. Remember all the actions you see from the U.S. now, whether in South America, Africa, or anywhere else, ultimately converge against the axis of evil, all categorized under major power competition. In the realm of major power competition, there's a plethora of elements. These four words encompass everything. The U.S. knows how to translate these words into concrete. Actions is project-based, task-based, so when people watch American movies, they often see a mission, a task completed. Yes, that's a project. On the other hand, the CCP operates in a centralized manner. Under Xi's leadership, how many projects can he handle? No matter how intelligent he is, can he manage 10 or 100 projects? He doesn't understand anything, plain and simple, this is the logic.